depends on the day. And what happened during that she has, because you, you may not know, um, she's part of probably like the most prestigious like radiology group um, in the city. So I don't know, but there's some real good people out there. And the point of my talk today is something really critical happened during that elective at a different time. And I didn't understand what had happened. And that's really why I wanted to talk to you. Was that during the chest radiology part where we were being taught how to read a chest x-ray, a radiologist put up an x-ray of the chest and asked all of us, again, there were you know, maybe 15 of us in the elective, okay, who sees something? And I immediately saw something. And I raised my hand and I was not called on. I think about four people raised their hands. And I don't know what they were going to say, but the person who was called on, I remember he said, oh, um, I see a white dot over there. Um, and the radiologist said, yeah, that's the finding. And it was a lung cancer. And I said to myself, yeah, I mean, how could you not see that? I'm, I'm talking to myself now. You know, that's what I would have said. And what was really interesting was about I'm not exaggerating, about four other people after that raised their hands and said to the radiologist, you know, if that's something, we're pointing to the cancer, why isn't that something? And they're pointing to things, the aortic knob, uh, pulmonary artery or vein, maybe a little piece of the rib, and they just can't differentiate it. And I remember sitting in this conference going, like, how can they not see that? <laughs> like there's this white light bulb over there and they're pointing this other stuff and that other stuff's nothing. I mean, you can just tell it's nothing. And what really would have been interesting would have been at that point in time, and I didn't understand still at that elective, I was done, radiology was not for me. I didn't understand at the moment in time what I, need, what I just learned about myself was that I was a visual person. And it would have been great, if the preceptors were all great during the elective, if somebody had said at that moment in time, hey, you know, those who saw this without having it pointed out to you, you're visual people. And consider going into this field, you're visual people. Those of you who either didn't see it or particularly after it was pointed out to you, you just sort of weren't able to differentiate it from other things. This is just probably not your thing. You're, you have other things that you're naturally come easily to you. Find out what those are. And the reason that I'm saying that it would have been helpful is I probably wouldn't have eliminated radiology necessarily. Um, and I would have put it not so much on a back burner um, as I did. And I would have understood and I've told people since then, and sometimes even when I'm interviewing people from medical school, and we, we talk about some things, people say, why do you become a radiologist? We focus on ourselves. But I say, you know, it's important to, I cannot teach someone to see the finding. I can teach them what it is. You can be taught it's lung cancer, it's a congenital anomaly, it's an infection, but you really can't be taught to see the finding. That has to happen from within. And so the point of this lecture or this talk is to try and tap into what comes naturally to you. So here's the rest of my story. I've eliminated, radio, eliminated radiology. I had an amazing mentor who was an endocrinologist. I thought that's what I wanted to be. And I now am doing my clinical rotations at Sinai in internal medicine. And I'm sent into a room by a preceptor and it's a murmur. And he said, you know, go into the room and he's, you know, only seen on the third floor or case and see. And I go in and I just can't hear anything. My understanding now is there's stethoscopes that really can help you out. But at the time, I just couldn't really make out anything. And I remember I came out of the room and you know, I said, mm -hmm. I didn't hear a thing. I don't know. I, mean, I knew the person was alive, but they were talking. So I went back into the room and he gave me a couple of tips and I came back out and I went, mm -hmm. and then we went in a third time. I wasn't crying or anything, but I felt like a little uncomfortable at this point. I was maybe my tears up for, you know, feeling a little like eek, eek. And we went in a third time and he told me about the whoosh, whoosh and the swoosh, swoosh and the love dub. And I came out and I went, I, I just can't, you know? And I said to him, you know, I don't know. And I was, ooh, I had a myringotomy. I, I don't know. Maybe there's something about the range or of this. I just can't hear it. And at that point, I walked out of that room and I said to myself, no one said it to me. Okay, all of internal medicine is out. This is over. 
I, this is just something I can't do. Uh, God knows how many years it would take for me to <laughs> hear heart sounds. And I'm going to have a practice and someone's going to walk in as a regular patient and then walk out and drop dead on the street. And I'm going to get a call from the pathologist saying, oh, by the way, this person had a murmur since they were a fetus. Why didn't they you hear it? And I'll go, well, I just don't do murmurs. I'm sorry. You know, it's sort of not my thing. So I realized all of internal medicine was out. Um, I went on to some other things. I went on to peds and even though I'm a visual person, for some reason, I, I just could never see the eardrum. It was explained to me what it looked like. Um, I looked in a number of eardrums with the otoscope and it was some, I think it was some white glistening thing I was told and I, I just really couldn't see it. And I remember walking out of peds and uh, my peds rotation, this is really a true story. And I walked out of peds rotation like, you know, Okay, I'm going to become a pediatrician. Someone's going to come into my office at 4 p.m., the last patient. I'm going to go, you look great. And then I'm going to get a call at, you know, 7 a.m. going, my kid just woke up with some blood on their pillow and they have otitis media when he was there the day before. And I'm going to go, you know what, Otis folks, <laughs> I'm so sorry. I was like, okay, peds out. And I like, you know, I like, I, I like internal medicine. I like peds. And I did internal medicine for a year. Ophthalmology, I looked into that. I looked into some fields where maybe I could have a life and do some other things. So I was checking on some of these fields. And ophthalmology, and this is the true story, um, I really couldn't see the retina. And it just, I just couldn't. Other people in my class could. I mean, they could really see it. It was easy for them. And one day, as doing my internship in medicine, I saw the retina. And I couldn't believe I went in with the ophthalmoscope. I saw the blood vessels for the first time in my life. I never saw it again. I couldn't have told you anything about what the blood vessels were. And I was like, oh my God, that was the retina. That's what people were talking about. And when I would write up my admissions, I always wrote retina not seen, retina not seen, retina not seen. So that eliminated, you know, some other fields like that. I also got very teary when I saw people with eye problems and like that. So that was out for another reason. Um, surgery, a little mitral valve prolapse. So when I was standing in the OR, I you know, kind of felt after like an hour, I needed to sit down. Um, so I wasn't, that wasn't for me either. And I had basically eliminated many, many things. And in the end of the day, when it came down time to apply for a residency, uh, the only thing I remember turning to my best friend, I go, you're not going to believe this. I've, I've eliminated everything. The only thing left is radiology. And it wasn't like I was happy about it because it didn't seem like I was going to be having patient contact, but I was okay with it because I was going into medicine to help people, um, to save lives. And um, still really at this point, I don't really under didn't really fully understand what had happened in that chess conference, but I just knew that I was doing this to help people. And I learned subsequently that it's just, you tend to be very happy in the field when you're doing something that comes naturally to you. Um, and I think it's really, really important to be happy in one's field. And I think this is true for all walks of life, that when you find something that is just comes naturally to you and you don't have to work as hard at it, you do have to work hard to learn the specifics of it and to learn the intricacies of the field. That's different. That's where the residencies come in and the fellowships. That's when you really hone in your craft. But if there's something about you that comes naturally to you, I would say don't rule it out because the lifestyle doesn't fit. Um, you might end up instead trying to find something where the lifestyle fits better. But if it's not something that comes naturally, it's not going to be a great fit is my point. And I have told people since, if you're amazing at surgery, and it's something where maybe you want a life and you've decided I can't have my life and do everything and be a surgeon. I'll, tell, I'll say to you, if you have to work three days a week and not be full-time, well, no, you're not gonna be the head of a department, the chair of a department. But if that's your natural bent and that comes easily to you and you're really good at it, people are gonna wait to have you operate on them, even if it's a Monday or Tuesday or Wednesday because it's just gonna be something where you're gonna be skilled at what you do. And that's really the point of my story is that to really try and tap into things where, and some people have more than one, I, I don't wanna call it a gift. It's just, it's just a, and I don't wanna really call it a talent. It's just, we all have things that come more easy to us. And it turns out I'm a very, very visual person. And sometimes that can be a person thing. You see things in 
uh, with other things, clothing, furniture that you don't want to see. You see defects that you really don't want to see that other people go, I didn't notice that little dent in that thing. I'm like, well, how are you kidding? I mean, yeah, I would never buy that. And, and you do see things and it happens to be throughout your whole walk of life. As it turns out, here I am in a practice where I do ultrasound every day, which is the thing that literally had turned me off in that elective. And as I said, I scan my own patients and you can work things into things that you can turn it into something that you can make it work for you. Um, maybe it's not done always that way in, in other practices. Maybe the technologist is the only person that sees somebody, but it is a very operator dependent field um, particularly ultrasound. So I, we find it very important that the physician has to create the image and I'm not going to rely even on a superb fact. So this is how my practice evolved. And I wish somebody had said to me in that elective that what I had said to you is that if there's something that you find that comes naturally to you, tap into that even if there's something about it with the lifestyle that maybe needs to be a turn off. See if you can be open to going into it. Don't rule it out. And you might even, I'm telling you, be able to tweak it and to make it almost perfect. And I've been very fortunate to be able to do that. But I have great peace of mind when I go to work every day um, and great security. And I think sometimes I don't want to talk about lack of peace of mind and lack of, lack of security. But I think that does happen in all walks of life when somebody's in something that sort of just doesn't speak to them. They're, they have to really work so hard at it to, for instance, maybe see things that other people just see right away. And it's the stakes are high in this. You know, it's the one thing where you really need to feel comfortable in what you're doing. And it's easier, like I said, to get educated and really start to get the details and what you need to start to figure out, you know, what's, what's cancer, what's benign, how do I start to uh, not give differentials and be very specific. And when you're a visual person, it gets much easier in radiology because you just are able to distinguish these differences uh, much more easily than someone who's not a visual person. I've had patients that's very complimentary and also referring physicians say to me, um, you see things other people don't. And whenever I'm told that, I say to them this, I go, I'm a visual person. And I said, and occasionally, non-visual people go into radiology. And that's, that's actually what the issue is. I said, it's not that I'm seeing things that people can't see. I said, visual people would all see what I'm seeing. And I think that's important too. So that's my story. If it helps um, people who are in their first and second year um, to, when you have an experience uh, where something really talks to you, I really want you to pay attention to it. I want you to say, you're gonna know it feels good. You, you, some, somebody I'm speaking to right now might have taken that out down so for the very first time seeing the retina, I'm like, listen, I'm telling you right now, you're a natural. I mean, maybe something about ophthalmology doesn't appeal to you, but you're an actor. Somebody in the OR that tied knots and cut and did something amazing and was, it was just something they were able to do. And other people, it took them a long time or you know, they, they just really weren't able to do it. Um, but somebody decided the lifestyle doesn't seem to be right. I go, think it over, do yourself a favor. Don't eliminate things because of lifestyle. Eliminate things more if it doesn't feel right and it just doesn't come naturally to you. It's not that you would study and you can't get better, but it's very hard to get better or as good as somebody where it's something that comes naturally to them. And that's what I hope, that I hope this has been helpful in some way when you're starting to decide about what feels wrong. Well. So that's pretty much what- That's a great point about um, not, not choosing something because you're worried about the lifestyle. Um, yeah, because, yeah. Sometimes, yeah but, and sometimes, I mean, I've had patients also, when we talked about it, have said, you know, well, somebody went into medical school thinking they wanted to do this. Remember, I had thought I wanted to be an endocrinologist. I realize now that it sort of not have been good for me either. Mm -hmm. um, it just wouldn't have sort of fit just with my brain. But again, I had this amazing mentor and I really looked up to him and respected him. He's my doctor to this very day. And it just wasn't the right field for me. 
Um, I certainly couldn't not have done it because, um, you know, at that moment in time, uh, obviously being an internal uh, medicine physician, uh, the stethoscope was pretty integral to an exam. And I just knew that people were going to come into my office and I was going to miss that. And mm. that's not why I went into medicine. It would have taken me years and years and years uh, to have heard what somebody wanted me to hear. And I still don't believe I would have been able to do it. Um, that's not out of insecurity. It just wasn't, wasn't something I was really able to do. It was just 20 years yeah. And I looked at a lot of retinas. I cried. <laughs> After a year of medicine, a lot of admissions. You know, we are looking at a lot of retinas and it wasn't like, you know, and people taught me that coming from the angle and you know, I was taught I people tried to show me and I was like, and that's another thing is um, to always be honest with yourself. And I don't think this has to be said, be honest with anybody else who can teach you that if it's not happening, it's not happening. And I'm sure after- your transition from, you started in academic. I did and switched. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, it was interesting. Um, so that was at NYU and I was again, very super specialized. I was just doing ultrasound and I was reading some CTs for them as well. I was in their private practice. It was then called Bridge Hospital. I was in the private practice and I was also in their in-hospital uh, patient department um, radiology. And I did that because, you know, I applied to various jobs. And uh, at the time, uh, the job where I am right now uh, did not have an opening. It turns out they ended up having an opening, but I had, this is also important too. I had uh, given my word to NYU that I was going to take the job. And an opening did actually happen a few weeks after I accepted the position. And um, I said, no, I didn't work to NYU. So I was there for a year and two months after that. And it was um, it was a great medical center for sure. Um, I was I think one of the benefits that I had as a medical student at Mount Sinai was there was a fair amount of independence. We got a lot of teaching um, in, at Mount Sinai, and then there was still teaching at the affiliates. Some some great teaching, as a matter of fact, at the VA and at Elmhurst. But there was a lot of independence. I was struck coming out of Mount Sinai, um, how independent I was able to be. Um, and I and also during my res, particularly after my residency at Mount Sinai. And I was struck sometimes how even fourth year residents still needed to still rely on attending. So it's a, a little bit of a double-edged sword to have that feeling when you're reading um, alone. Um, and then you again are kind of honing your skills with uh, you know, books and you're on call and, you know, of course you're having attendings, you know, the next morning that can go over things, but at the moment in time, you're sometimes, you know, really independent. And I felt that there was a great balance that you want a residency program where you have some independence and you also have to do great teaching. I think that's really important. And sometimes you get that in the area of hospitals uh, where you're able to go to other institutions and be a little more on your own and not be afraid of that because you're, you're getting that kind of teaching as well. And it really serves you well when you go out in the real world. Uh, you are going to be the one I was never afraid of taking oral boards in radiology. Um, I wasn't crazy about the written boards, um, particularly the physics part. But in the time when I took my radiology boards, I went, this is a real film. I mean, somebody had this, this is a real person. And I could just as easily be sitting in Elmhurst Hospital at 2 a.m. and having to read this. And I think that was something that I got a lot out of my I got a lot out of my fellowship team as well. A tremendous amount, actually. So as far as talking about full-time and private, um, you know, it's a whole other story. You know, private practice is an amazing ability to be your own boss and have other partners, but there's something very special about that hard to accomplish in the same age and you know, the landscape has changed. If someone was presented with that opportunity or could create that opportunity, I would say they look into it. Um, but I think more important than that so much is not so much where you're practicing what you're doing, it's to make sure you're going into a field that feels right for you. That's what I would say is the most critical part of what I'm talking to you about today. 
I think that's really it. I think that's what gives the most satisfaction in your career is to go into something that feels like a natural fit. And as I said, you know, the stakes are very high in this. You know, there's a lot to be said if someone's in the financial world and you destroy somebody financially, they creates a lot of stress, obviously, when somebody when that happens. But medicine is the one place where you really have this ability that you have a chance to save people's lives and to get people better. And there's really no other field like that. So there's a lot of responsibility with it. And I think to have on top of that a feeling of, yeah, I wanted to something that just doesn't feel quite right. And after years and years and years, I'll, I'll get good at it and I'll get more good at it. I'm a person, I get good at it. But I think the most important thing is to get that fit and have it feel natural, that, have it feel comfortable. And then the learning part on top of it is it's fun. You know, it, it feels good. So as far as full time versus private, um, I'm not sure you know how many options there are for that world anymore. And yeah. I would say that's not as important. So um, Samantha or Anatina or um, Emma, if you want, feel free to take yourself off mute if you have any questions for Dr. Schultz. Yeah. Emma, how's the interview process going? It's, I'm sure it's completely different now that it's all virtual. That's not me, actually. I think that was oh. somebody else. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So, so far I've interviewed for some prelim programs and I'm interviewing for radiology programs in the next week. but. Yeah, it's different in that um, rather than flying out and kind of like doing a dinner and stuff with the um, residents and everything's on Zoom. So I, um, I have an interview tomorrow and it's three Zoom sessions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's definitely pros and cons because like I feel like, you know, sometimes flying out and like making the trip that can be a lot of hassle. Yeah, that's awesome. yeah. Um, I do think it's hard too. There's a certain energy that happens in a room. Um, that you pick up on with people. And I think that is very hard to do that virtually. Um, so yeah. I think, yeah, and I think that is something that's missing sometimes, um, mm -hmm. which is which is harder for sure. Um, yeah. but, but that said, I think you can still get a really good read. You, I think you will be able to get a good read about um, a program and the people. And I think overall people can get a good read on somebody mm -hmm. for sure. Definitely. Yeah. Well, I wish you the best of luck. It's an amazing field. I used to laugh when I was going out with students. I go, you know, 90% of the diagnosis is history, which, by the way, is still very true. And that's one of the things I love talking to my own patients and getting the history from them. Once in a blue moon, I'll have a patient say to me, yeah, but my doctor wrote down everything on the prescription. And I read it, and I went, well, you're here. <laughs> you're here, so I want to hear it from you. And it's amazing, you know, seriously, even to this day, if you're taking your own history and how much of that is so critical, and that's when you want medical school mm -hmm. and how critical that is about really making the correct diagnosis. And usually I say the rest of the other topics of radiology. So apologies to anybody else. <laughs> but uh, it's uh, more important, as I said, to tap into something that feels right. I think we've all tapped into things that haven't feel, felt right. I could ask, and, it, and I don't want to make it seem like you, know, you got to eliminate all those things and it doesn't feel right and you can't learn things, but it's just something about trying to kind of understand yourself better. And I think we all have a gut instinct about things that feel good and comfortable. And um, I think that's important to listen to that and I think it's a really smart thing to do. I wish somebody had told me that. It would have been a lot easier. I probably wouldn't have been on the uh, going through all these other fields. I'm glad I did. Um, so there were no regrets. You know, I had to pick a field that I thought I was going to be very isolated from patients if I hadn't looked into all these other fields, uh, which of course I did on those patients. Uh, maybe I would have felt like, gee, you know, maybe if I looked at some more retinas and listened to more heart sounds, that maybe I would have done something else. But I certainly did enough. I had enough exposure to know what really didn't feel right and what did feel right. And I just needed somebody to say to me, it's never gonna be a perfect fit. And there's gonna be things, mine worked out great, but that doesn't always happen. But don't eliminate something because it's of a lifestyle or something else about it that might turn you off, like safety contact and safety That's what I would say. Keep an open mind when it, when it feels right. 
try and make it work. Could you walk? Oh, I was just going to ask if you could walk through maybe what a typical day looks like for you. So how many patients do you see? Um, how many scans do you read? Because I think as a second year student, I don't really get to see a lot of this mm. um, sure. yet. So I don't have so much exposure. Right. So remember, I'm only doing all the exam. So mm -hmm. it's a little bit, you know, skewed. But I can do a full day for me would be 24 people. That's a lot. Um, so that's I do have patients scheduled every 15 minutes. Um, and sometimes there's a gap in that. And so, you know, you get kind of proficient with doing it. And from a visual person, you know, it's not like I'm struggling to see these images. Um, one of the things, so there are days, maybe I'll do 20 people, day I'll do 24. And there could be some days where it's 18 or 15 or 14 for the hands and all that's going on. And it may sound like a, a, a lot, it is a lot. Um, one of the things that when there's a very, very busy schedule, I feel that some of the time that I spend my patients is most fascinating is the ultrasound's totally normal and you get to talk to somebody about something that's actually not medically related. And sometimes you actually, that's some of the best part of my day is talking as I'm scanning, if I'm in the room with patient scanning, and we're talking about other things, either with their lives. And occasionally I've also had people mention medical things to me that are really important. And I'll say, you know, bad way, you call it to your doctor. And I'll go, no, I didn't. And I'm like, hey, man, I'm going to get you dressed. And we're going to call up, you know, that person. And I want to make sure that they know about it. And some of these things have happened. A lot of diagnosis and diff on people. A lot of medicine is common sense. And a lot is history. It's, it's judgment, common sense, and history. And I've had people coming in and telling me things. And I'm like, hey, you need to call. And I think you need to see diff, you know. And some of them have had it. And it's, it's interesting, and this is not for a radiologist to necessarily diagnose, but that's some of the really interesting uh, parts of my day and some of the fun parts of the day, not that, but just other things that we're talking about as you're in the room. So patient contact can be great, but it can be very, very busy. Um, sometimes it's a little too busy. Um, and that's, you know, then you're just doing your job in the sense of I got to make sure that I'm looking at what I have to look at and I'm finishing the face. And those aren't as fun because the fun part to me is the, is the connection. I, my practice has become extremely specific and very interested in finding early cancers. So even though we have people who come to me for a problem that's diagnostic for radiology, the majority of my patients every day, I would say like 90% feel great and they wanna make sure that they don't have something serious. So my passion, my huge passion is finding stage one of the cancers. My other huge passion is starting several years ago, even though a lot of our patients are female, started saying we have them on the table, let's start screening everybody's pancreas for pancreatic cancer. And we saved about 15 people now with um, early pancreatic cancer just because we were there and we happened to look there um, because it's something that became important. And that's another part of our practice, which I'm really, really obviously enjoying. And, uh, you know, I enjoy some of the interesting tough cases, uh, a lot of topics and other people have scanned and then they send to their community. There's cases like that as well that are very interesting. But the cancer cases, particularly, I'm looking for cancers and most insurance people on time on stage one. So the majority of my patients, believe it or not, feel great. And they're coming to know that they're okay. It's a very uh, selective patient population, male and female. More, more female, but we're definitely segmenting from the male population. So. so it's a busy day. What is the exposure to radiology during med school? Is it is it somewhere during third year or? I'm sorry. I'm just wondering for for the med students, when are you actually getting exposed to radiology? Yeah, when are you getting exposed? I guess they have it set up right now. Is that with every clerkship, we have like some modules to complete online that are with radiology. But um, there's no, you don't have to actually go and do an elective in radiology and you never actually have to go to a nursing room if you're not interested in it. You were kind of coming in and out for me. So no. I got it through an elective, but it's an integral part of, you know, obviously medicine and surgery. There's a lot of overlap. Um, but so I guess when you're doing your third year rotations and fourth year rotations, a lot of radiology diagnostic imaging gets incorporated into the clerkship, I think, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. I would recommend, like, if you're interested at all, doing the elective with Dr. Richard Stern, um, the body imaging elective. And I actually did it last week, and he does a virtual elective now. 
Um, so that's really convenient. Terrific. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, and yeah, um, Dr. Mm -hmm. there's also I, like a I, chest yeah. radiology elective and um, you can do the, I did the two week elective at Mount Sinai West, which I thought was really cool because you get exposed to all the different types. As a visual person, I think one of the other film fields I could have gone into would have been germ, and I did check it out. I had gone to an elective at the time, it's a long time ago, at NYU, and it happened just to be in their psoriasis clinic, and it just, it, it just didn't speak to me, you know, but was, I'm certainly a visual person, talking about that. so that would have been another visual field for sure, and it would have been surgical as well, which, again, just sort of wasn't my thing, but, um, Again, uh, you know, it was interesting to finally understand what that white dot meant. It, it's, it's really interesting. Very recently, I was talking to, I was interviewing somebody from medical school, and it's the very first time. And again, most people don't ask you about it as well. You really don't want to spend time talking about yourself and about the person. But again, he did ask me why I was doing radiology, and I was like, really quickly, yeah, my it's not people. And he cut me off and he said, oh, wait a minute. So you're telling me, so you saw the white dot, but nobody can teach you to do that. They can teach you what it was, and which I explained in the talk to you, and I, it was the first time I said to him, wow, the first person who really understood what that was all about. And uh, that's kind of my mantra now, is to try and figure that out for yourself. And some people are lucky. They have more than one. You know, they can be a visual person, they can be a technically, you know, very skilled with their hands, um, and they can have a few things going on. Most people are very lucky. They can pick several things. But um, uh, has any of you had an experience where you feel that you rotated through something and it spoke to you? You just felt like, yeah, it sounds easy to me. Yeah, I could do this. Yeah, I, I see it. And maybe other people around you are lying. You know, I, I just sort of don't get it. Or maybe no one around you was saying anything. Um, did Has anybody had an experience where they have learned about themselves yet? Something that comes naturally to them? Or something that doesn't come naturally to them to avoid, for that matter, if they, maybe they should? Has anybody had that yet as a medical student? I know my radiology, prospective radiology uh, person is a visual person, I'm sure. Yeah, I feel like for me, at least when I was a first year and we were looking at, we had to look at our chest CTs and during anatomy, I remember being super confused because when you're a first year, you don't really know much medicine and everything can be kind of overwhelming. So I think the cool part about radiology is like the more you know, the more you kind of understand. And I feel like like in my third year clerkships, um, I was considering many different things also. I was considering peds and medicine. And mm -hmm. I realized I didn't, I liked parts of those, but not every single day of it. And mm -hmm. for me, once I did my radiology elective, I realized I loved like every part of it. And I thought it was kind of interesting going between CT, MRI, and, and all of the different modalities. And what I'll say about you, even though I've never met you, I don't know you, to love something means you're a visual person. Because otherwise, you're looking at an MR, you're looking at a CT, and people are pointing out things, and you're like, I just don't see it. So you must be seeing it if you, if you have to be, if you love it. Because you just don't love things that, um, when you're looking at things, and you know, it's like I said, it's one thing to learn what it is that you're looking at. It's another to be able to innately learn to see it. So you must be a visual person that you enjoy it. It can be impossible. Otherwise, it creates a little anxiety when people are like, I don't see what the person's pointing out. Okay, they call me for the moment. I remember once um, earlier in our practice, for many, many years, we did first and second and third trimester OB, and now we just do first trimester and strictly following the second trimester. And I remember I had a patient on the table who was pregnant and uh, the significant other was pregnant. And they had a child who was like four years old. And I was pointing out a body part and the, the parents were clueless. So I, I told them, you know, what it was and they still couldn't understand it. And this little kid, you know, points to the screen and starts pointing out parts of the anatomy. I turned to the parents, I go, listen, I don't know what this kid's gonna be when they grow up, but I mean, like, please remember this. 
and remember radiology. Maybe you'll be an amazing photographer. I don't know, but you've got a visual person here. <laughs> and he's pointing out, that's the hand. <laughs> that's the foot, that's the face. And the parents are going, what? What is that? You know, and I'm like. That's amazing. <laughs> it's a true story. I was like, he's four years old. I'm like, this kid's a natural. <laughs> so that's what I'm asking people to tap into. There's a lot of fields out there. You know, you want to, there's a lot of choices. And like I said, some people can pick a number of things and be very, very happy. Um, but you want to just try and find something where it, it speaks to you and it feels good and that feeling feels good about it. The stakes are too high otherwise. Yeah. So bring that. And again, you can learn a lot, but it's just very different when you're going into a field that feels comfortable to you. It's easier to be much better at it than when people don't have comfortable. So, again, there's a lot of options out there. And there's, and there's a fair amount of overlap too. I, it's unusual to have a B1 field. And like I said, you know, just right off, I could say German and radiology for sure, the visual piece of myself. Um, add surgical skill, wow, visual and surgical skill. I mean, you know, more delay speed. Surgical skill was not my thing, which is another reason I wasn't particularly interested in that. I hope this makes sense. I mean, it's a lot of it's common sense. I mean, I just felt that I wanted to speak to people who were in their first and second years who still haven't, who have their whole future ahead of them. I mean, it's hard to imagine things. Sometimes there's so many options. Like, how do I narrow it down? And this is just one way to, to help do that, is to start trying to get focused on the options that you have. There's so many of them. You start all these locations. And you know, a lot of times you do enjoy a lot of them, and that's great. But ultimately, you do have to make a decision. And I just want to help people recognize what's within themselves to guide them in a way to help them make what's the best decision. And definitely doing electives early, I think, and getting as much exposure as you can your first and second year is, is, is a good idea. So it's good to it's good to hear about the electives that are available. Yeah. And again, like don't rule something out. Just get some life yeah. stuff that you seem to be what you want or the patient contact you need to serve what you want. You know, in the end you're in this to help people and to save lives and uh, your best opportunity to do that is when something feels, feels right. And then you hone your skills in more education. And it's not that you can't learn something that you're not naturally good at, you can. It's just that you want to be the best that you can be. So yeah. it's an advantage. It's a, it's a very, very distinct advantage to go into something that just feels natural. And, I, and again, I don't, I don't call these gifts and somebody's gifted. Um, I think it's misinterpreted sometimes that the person is gifted. And I think instead what's happened is some people who, you know, just maybe it wasn't, it wasn't a field that really spoke to them got into that field. And it makes somebody else look gifted. But instead it's more that oh, not somebody went into it, but it just wasn't sort of their thing. But they picked it for a reason. And that's another thing to have a very open mind in medical school for people who have gone in maybe with a preconceived notion or have a mentor that they really look up to and that may influence them and just keep an open mind about it. That's what I would say. I, I love what I do every day. You know, it's, um, I just can't imagine actually never working. It's sort of silly comment, but you know, people talk all the time about winning a lot of them. I go, I don't know, I might have to do it five days a week. <laughs> but, I would be coming in every day or three days or four days a week. It wouldn't change what I do. And I think a lot of people, if they had, you know, an opportunity to not do what they do every day, they would they would leave it. Um, yeah. And I know that from a lot of my patients. And when I hear that, it just makes me think, wow, I guess they just can go into something that really speaks to me. Yeah. And it's just an amazing feeling because at the end of the day, I just feel like, wow, I just really enjoy what I do and I love what I do. And, so, and I think you only feel that way when you're doing something that comes more easily to you and that you're comfortable with. Yeah. So if somebody had said to me, no, you're going to stand in the OR and do this, and I'm like, wow, or, no, you've got to become an ophthalmologist. Like, oh my God, man, how many diabetic retinopathy do you need for that? That's a very unsettling kind of feeling, even with having completed I would never be as good as somebody else who really 
you know, took that out of the scope and throw it in the evidence. And there are people who do that, and I guarantee you there's people in the medical class who are doing that. Yeah. Uh, and there's other people who are doing other things that come after them. Yeah. That's kind of the point of my talking is uh, don't necessarily eliminate anything if it feels right. Maybe you can tweak it. And that's what I ended up doing. So that was 19, probably 89. Um, I don't know, I guess it was the two that I spoke to my best friend and said, you know, <laughs> if I ever become a radiologist, here I am loving it every day. What did she wind up going into? She became an endocrinologist. No, really? That's yeah. Funny. Yeah. And we were in, you know, we were with the same preceptor, not the one who put me into the uh, room to listen to the heart thing. But uh, and he was an endocrinologist and brilliant, and she, but she could hear heart singing, and I couldn't. <laughs> <laughs> um, so any any last questions, um, Samantha or Emma? No. And I love my year of medicine too. I mean, it was really different, uh, but I, I really did enjoy that year very different. And uh, but, you know, it, uh, it's obviously a very very different field for sure. Yeah, if anybody listen, I mean, I, I would imagine there's ways you can reach out to me, right? If uh, you need to um, follow up and when things change and somebody might want to shadow and come for a day, and I'd be happy to have. Yeah, that would be great. So maybe yeah. maybe just contact Jason if you. Yeah, uh, we've had, I've had medical students here. I've also taught uh, years ago, we said residents come to school, which is a lot of fun too. Early in OBGYN, we would come. And uh, we really enjoy having you know students come. And it's it's kind of eye opening. I think people do get a really good sense of it. It's a, sometimes I'll I'll tell that somebody's in Nashville because we'll be looking at the screen and I'll show them the postmenopausal ovary and like oh that's the ovary yeah I'll go yeah and other people you know you're pointing it out and they're like where what mm -hmm. and I'll sort of know you know in my own mind I'll go mm, probably this isn't the thing for them you know but. It's the uh, same with my patients. You know, a lot of them can look at a screen and they see something, and, uh, and other people can look at a screen and kind of you know, not, not be aware of what it is that you're looking at. But the right, so maybe if you don't mind if they contact you through J, maybe if you guys yeah. email Jason and then he can contact you to see if to set it up. Yeah, I, I mean, I hope this has helped in some way. I, I just, I really do wish that in my experience the only thing that i wish was that one person and it's fine that the person didn't say it but if the radiologist that, that day had said like what i said earlier in the talk hey for you for those of you who saw that before i pointed it out <laughs> think about it yeah think about it you know and for those that after we pointed out you can describe and you still couldn't see it yeah, move on to something else that's my advice. Perfect. There's a lot to choose from. So yes. why not choose something that feels right? Uh, and that, we're not talking about uh, not learning and really, really educating yourself with residencies and fellowships. That's what that's all about. That's getting the details. That's getting the, and then life, of course, uh, you know, really, really seeing what, learning what things are. Sort of at this point, after being in this practice for 33 years, um, every now and then, it's very rare for me to see something I've never seen before. Um, and I have told patients that, but I'm able to tell them if it's a non mm -hmm. How I'm able to do it. I may not have seen it before, but I, I know that it's significant. And that's from years of experience. All right. Well, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy day. The really, really great advice, especially after having 33 years in practice. It's like pretty. Yeah. Hard. You know, you're always learning. That's the thing too. Yeah. You know, that's what's so amazing about me. It's always growing and changing. And learning. And, uh, there's a field, not every field can do that. Yeah. So I've enjoyed talking to you guys. I hope it. I hope something has resonated. And if it if it makes a difference, I hope so. Um, I know you're all superb. You're at Sinai, and it's very hard to uh, medical school to get into. So you all pick because uh, you're incredible candidates, and this is help. And any way to help you with uh, figuring out when the time comes to choose a residency um, or for that matter.
Good luck on your Thank interview. You. Yeah. Lucky interview. And again, any more questions at any time, I'm available. All right. Have a good night. All right. Good night. Bye. Nice meeting all of you.